Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We are in the fifth chapter of Acts. And as we left the fourth chapter, we read that um, anyone, there, there wasn't anybody needy. This is verse 34. Because those who owned lands or houses sold them. And they brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as any had need. And we talked about that. We're going to pick it up there as we go into chapter 5. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. As we go into your word, we pray that you open up our hearts and minds to hear your spirit speak to us and to reveal to us the truth of your word. And as such, may our minds be shaped and changed to think in ways that glorify you. And this we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. We talked last week, how does a community get to a place where there's absolutely nobody needy? Because if there is a need... Somebody within that particular community will sell an asset and give it to the apostles to distribute. So now the apostles are involved in distributing various monies, resources to those who had need. And therefore, nobody was in need. And we talked about because that's just not, I mean, there's certainly within a community, there, there are people that make donations and help one another out and so on and so forth. It's not like it doesn't happen. It certainly does. And there's times where I've heard churches, especially quite large churches, well, they'll, where they will do a fundraising thing and get, you know, a million dollars and buy a whole bunch of stuff, say, for kids that are going to school. Um, so those kind of things do happen. It's not like they don't happen. But how is it that you have a community where absolutely nobody within that community is in need? And we talked about the reality, the spiritual reality that wherever the, the, that the eagerness of Jesus return sets the standard, if you will, or the level of holiness. And the greater that a community expects and eagerly expects his return, the greater the level of holiness, the greater level of holiness, the greater level of realization that none of this is ours to begin with, and that God is at work in such a powerful way. We can trust the apostles because we're looking forward to Jesus' return any moment. Now, that then leads us to chapter 5, where we pick it up. But a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. Now remember, Barnabas in the last chapter was someone who sold a piece of property and gave all of it to the apostles. That was an example that was um, given to us at the very, the very last few verses of chapter 4. Now you get Ananias and Sapphira doing the same thing. However, this is verse 2. He kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge and brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Remember, the apostles were the ones that were in charge of distributing to those who had need various resources. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of of the proceeds of the land. Was it, wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to people, but to God. When he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead, and a great fear came on all who heard. The young men got up, wrapped his body, carried him out, and buried him. Now, what's happening here? It all goes back to verse 2. Ananias kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge and brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But when he did so, he told them that what he is laying at their feet 
is the total proceeds. How do we know this? Because in verse 7, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Tell me, Peter asked her, did you sell the land for this price? Yes, yeah, she said, for that price. Then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. So what took place is that Ananias and Sapphira had a piece of property. They sold it for a certain amount of money. And rather than, well, and then they took part of the proceeds and kept that for themselves, took the rest of the money from that sale, and then gave it to the apostles' feet or gave it to them, but told them that the amount of money that they laid before the apostles was the full amount that they received from the sale of the property. Now, what Peter is saying here is simply this. It was yours. Um, I'm going to read this again. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Tell me, Peter asked her, did you sell the land for this price? So, what, what, what took place here is they sold the land, took part of it for themselves, and then they gave the rest of the proceeds to the apostles to give to the poor, but told the apostles that what they were giving them was the entire amount that they received from the purchase. In other words, they simply lied. They had every right to hold back as much as they wanted to. It was their property. In fact, Peter says this in verse 4. Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? In other words, it's yours. You can do with it as you want. If you wanted to hold, if you wanted to sell this, hold on to half of what it was paid for or, or, or purchased for and give us the other half, that's completely fine. It's yours. You get to do with it what you want. But what you did is you lied to us. That was, that was what was called into the light. This lying about the money, not that they didn't have any right to do with it what, with what they did. They did. They had every right. It's their money. But they lied about it. And what he said was, in verse 3, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? It's the lying. And it wasn't just lying. And this is a very important understanding. It wasn't that they were doing it to the people or to the apostles they were lying to the Holy Spirit that filled the community of faith. They were doing it to God. They were lying to God. And when being called out in terms of what they were doing, the fear of being called out was so great that they died. Now, I'm not saying they died of the fear. We don't know what they died from. It does not say that the Lord killed them. It doesn't say that at all. But after being called out, it was such an uh, uh, embarrassment or fear, whatever the case may be. He just died. And so did she. It never says once that the Lord took their life. But they did die from the realization of what they've done. At least that's how I read for the, the, the events of what caused her death. So, in verse 10 then, instantly she dropped dead at his feet. When the young men came in, they found her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Then great fear came on the whole church and on all who heard these things. So, this fear is the beginning of wisdom, so says the scripture. Fear, to be clear, is can be a very 
and beneficial and essential beginning and foundation for wisdom. It can also be a bondage that the enemy places us in. The enemy is skilled at manipulating fear to keep us in bondage. But fear of the magnitude of God himself is the beginning of wisdom. It doesn't stop there. It doesn't end there, but it is, it does start there. It's no different than going to the end of a, or yeah, to the edge of a deep, deep ravine or a cliff and realizing the magnitude of what would take place if you took a step off that cliff or if you slipped, the cliff is not out to hurt you. The cliff is not out to threaten you. But the magnitude of the situation brings with it wisdom. This is the fear of the Lord that brings wisdom. And as the spirit is moving to almost purify, if you will, the moving of the spirit among the people, sins will be called out. Now, aren't you glad that God doesn't do this in every single situation? He doesn't. But in this case, he made a, 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 a specific action demonstrating the reality of his presence among the apostles and not to take advantage of it or to, or to take lightly of it or to try to belittle it or diminish it by lying to it. After that, we get verse 12. Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's colonnade. That's an important place in Jerusalem. Jesus spent a lot of time there as we read um, in the Gospel of John. Verse 13, no one else dared to join them, but the people spoke well of them. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers. Now, what does that mean? No one dared to join them. No one dared to join the apostles, if you will. They were they were given this assignment on behalf of God and in the name of Jesus. And there was a fear that was a healthy fear that they still viewed them as human beings. They weren't gods, but they were God's anointed in this case to carry out his ministry. So there was a fear that came upon the people to treat them according to the calling that God had placed on their life. Verse 14, believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitude of both men and women. As a result, they would carry the sick out into the streets and lay them on cots and mats so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. In addition, a multitude came together from the town surrounding Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. This is the, 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 the power that was going out that was, that was a, a staple of Jesus' ministry has now been poured upon the apostles. Now, gifts of the Spirit were practiced within the community, but there are certain gifts that can be given that rely on the development of the character of the people that they're given to. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about next time because it's, it's very clear that in this case, the apostles are the ones that are, that are manifesting these signs and wonders. But the apostles themselves had been with Jesus for an amount of time and during that time of their discipleship, their character was transformed so that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, the gifts that were first demonstrated in Jesus' ministry could now be demonstrated within them, and it would not take them and bring them to a place of arrogance or pride or get them out of the will of God. The next time we get together, we'll pick it up with verse 17, because whenever there's a manifestation of the Spirit, it will come into conflict with the powers that be that are threatened by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for tuning in. I 
pray that this devotion was meaningful to you. And I look forward to getting into the, uh, the, the word again next time when we're together. Until then, peace be with you. Bye-bye.